In the furniture making studio's hand tool heavy as mine, you'd think that my most important hand plane would be my jack plane. Jack of all trades and all that. But I actually use my jointer plane for a lot of the operations you'd use a jack plane for. And not only that, I don't own a power joiner, so I use this to flatten all of my stock and joint all of my stock. But you know what? That's not my most important plane either. Truth be told, I'm not so sure that the most important hand plane in my shop is a bench plane at all. So in this video, I'm gonna fess up as to what that is. I'll show you my setup for it and how I get the most out of it. I literally could not do what I do as efficiently as I do it without this plane. So here it is. This is the Lee Nielsen number 51 shooting board plane. It's based on the old Stanley number 51. This thing weighs about nine pounds, so it carries a lot of momentum through the cut and also has a blade that's skewed at about 20 degrees. It's a, a bevel down blade that's bedded at about 25 degrees and the blade is about two and three eighths inches wide. This thing was $500 when I bought it. It's easily the most expensive hand plane I own. That said, I believe it's paid itself off many times over, in my estimation. Uh, nowadays it goes for about 650, so this is not a cheap hand plane. Now I know this will probably come up, so I may as well address it here. People are gonna ask, you know, you have a bunch of Veritas stuff in your tool cabinet, like a lot of it. And so how did you end up with a Lee Nielsen shooting board plane as opposed to the Veritas version? And the reason for that is the Veritas version didn't exist yet came out maybe three or four months after I bought this one. Uh, that said, there's a lot about the Veritas shooting board plane that speaks well for it. Uh, for one, it's quite a bit cheaper. It currently sells for about 366 bucks, so it's uh, almost $300 cheaper than the Lee Nielsen. That right there uh, would kind of turn the tables for me if I were shopping for one today. Um, it comes in both in right and left-handed versions. Uh, like the Lee Nielsen, the blade is skewed at about 20 degrees, uh, but it's bevel up and it's bedded at about 12 degrees. So the effect of cutting angle is pretty low on that uh, plane. It's, I think, about 35 degrees. The blade is almost as wide at about two and a quarter, so not much difference there, but it's available in the choice of O2 steel or PMV11. The PMV11 tool steel is really nice. I have some other uh, hand planes that have that tool steel in it and it sharpens really easily and it holds its uh, sharpness uh, pretty well too. It's a really good balance that way. And so yeah, I'm a big fan of the PMV11 steel. The Veritas version is a little bit lighter than the Lee Nielsen uh, at about seven and three quarter pounds, whereas the uh, Leo Nielsen, like I mentioned earlier, uh, is more like nine. And the Veritas version is 16 inches long as opposed to 15, so not a huge difference there. But yeah, the Veritas shooting board plane is probably what I would purchase today if I were doing it again, but just having a dedicated shooting board plane is so nice. Uh, it works perfectly fine, so if it wasn't broken, I wasn't gonna fix it. You can use any bench plane to do uh, end grain shooting. You can use a block plane even, as long as your plane has 90 degree sides on the body of the plane, you can use it. But having a dedicated plane for that particular purpose is really nice, and it's hard to go back once you get used to using one. So this is the shooting board that I started out with. It was made by Even Falls Studios back in 2013. At the time, I was still pretty new to hand tool working. I wasn't so confident that I could make something that was really accurate for this purpose. And uh, I had also already gotten rid of my table saw at that time, so, so I just went and bought one. So this one has some nice features to it. It has a track specifically for a shooting board plane. It has a strip on the outside of the plane that kind of keeps it from moving off of the cut and you can adjust it to fit. You get the right amount of tension there. Also has an adjustable fence. You can take these screws out, flip it over and move it into place where I have these inserts at uh, 22 and a half degrees and 45 degrees. That said, there were things about it that I thought kind of fell short for my purposes. For one, it would be nice to get more angles out of it. And he, uh, at the time there were versions of it that had more angles, but I wanted something that was like, you know, like infinitely adjustable. And also when I was using it, just in here, when I was using typical thickness stock of, you know, something uh, up to or just shy of an inch, I was always dulling the blade, this portion of the blade, while the rest of it was remaining sharp. And I'm like, why am I sharpening this big wide blade and only using the bottom, you know, third of it? And, uh, you know, I don't love to sharpen. I like the woodwork. So um, that kind of got frustrating after a while as well. And then there's an issue of capacity. You know, I build really big pieces, so to my mind, it would have been nice to have a shooting board that was even bigger than this one. And so I will show you what I ended up doing 
to address those issues. Now, I think it's important to stop for a moment and make you aware that if you want to get one of these nifty shooting boards from Even Falls Studios, you can't. And the reason for that is in 2018, uh, Rob Hansen's home and shop uh, burnt down in the campfire in Paradise, California. And uh, the reason that hits home for me is that a little over a year ago, we had the Marshall Fire here in Colorado, and it came about a third of a mile from destroying our home and everything in it as well. That would include my tool cabinet, my workbench, my wall hanging mirror, pretty much everything we own. And so, yeah, I'm a little salty about that. Um, I've always had this idea in my head of Mother Nature being this kind of motherly figure, like a, like a grandmother or something. And more and more, I'm starting to realize that she's more like Xena Warrior Princess. And if you screw with her, she will F you up. And uh, yeah, so that's my little public service announcement to take care of the environment. We need woodworkers like Rob around. And to the best of my knowledge, he hasn't really picked up again and started making shooting boards. So if you are in the market for a shooting board, if you want to purchase one instead of build one, uh, of course, there are options like Lee Valley and Veritas, uh, where you can either build a complete one from the get-go or you can build your own using the accessories that they sell separately, like I did. Another one that I can easily recommend is uh, Vote, Vote uh, Shooting Boards. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I should know better because I've met him personally. Uh, but I can easily recommend Tico Vote's uh, shooting boards as well. So I'll try to leave a link in the description for those options. Um, and in the meantime, uh, yeah, take care of where you live. Because if you don't, you might end up with a place where you can't live. So this is the shooting board that ended up replacing my original one, and you can see the size difference there. That's quite dramatic. And before I did the build, I acquired two parts of it that were pretty key. One is the Veritas adjustable shooting board fence. Now this one's adjustable to literally any angle I want, up to about 60 degrees, but it also has detents. Detents at uh, zero, 18 degrees, 22 and a half degrees, 30 degrees, 36, 45, and 60. And it also has an, a slotted fence that allows you to attach a shop made sacrificial fence. And of course that can be slid out of the way when you uh, adjust it to a larger angle. And of course the sacrificial fence can also be used to support your workpiece at the back side of the cut so you don't blow out the ingrained fibers on that back corner, although I don't actually use it for that, and uh, I'll explain more about that later. Another thing I bought for the sake of the build is this Veritas shooting board track. Now this track is available both in 16 inch and 24 inch lengths, which are priced at like $49 and $63 respectively. But um, unless all you ever build is tiny keepsake boxes and that sort of thing, I would get the longer one for sure. It's an aluminum track with a stainless steel outer rail, which is slotted. It uh, has slotted holes with slotted screws in them that you can adjust in and out to uh, adjust to the width of your shooting board plane and hold it snug. And it comes with this self-adhesive tape that you line the track with called UMHW strips. Um, it stands for Ultra High Molecular Weight and that's just a fancy way of saying that this particular type of plastic is very slippery. So once this is lined with that UMHW tape uh, both on the bottom of the track and along the inner edge of that outer rail, um, you have a surface that is nice and slippery and doesn't need to be lubricated with you know, wax or oil or anything like that. So as far as the build for my shooting board is concerned, I did it a little bit differently than you typically see. So one of the things I did is I actually ramped the track for that. And the purpose of that is to get more out of the width of my shooting plane blade, which is ample. Another thing I did with the design of my shooting board is I made it a little bit extra wide and put extra supports at this end of it and throughout the construction that's the way it sat until I got to the point where I could just saw a bit of it off and then I could put a spline in there like that that has a couple of magnets on it, one at each end and a corresponding slot with magnets in it on the off cut and just fits on there like that and that's the way it normally sits. But when I want to do a really long board on my shooting board, like that, you'll notice that the weight of the board wants to bring it out of square with the blade, and I have to press on it pretty hard to prevent that. Well, the way I prevent that now is I just separate that piece of shooting board, move it down the bench, and now it holds my board for me, perpendicular to the blade, and I'm ready to go. Just like that. 
One thing that's kind of counterintuitive about having a larger capacity shooting board is that it actually allows me to work with smaller work pieces more easily. So not only can I shoot the end grain of a small piece like that, but I can flip it this way and do the long grain, and then I have a perfectly square corner on that edge. So I'm going to do that right now. You can see that uh, this is a rough sawn with a handsaw edge right here, so I'm going to shoot the end of that. And I also mentioned earlier that the uh, sacrificial fence that uh, you're supposed to use with it uh, is supposed to support the back side of the cut so that the end grain doesn't blow out. And I don't really use it like that. What I do instead is I have a scrap piece of wood like this. I come in here with a paring chisel. And actually I have a line drawn on here that I'm going to shoot the board to, to get to that length. And I'm just gonna cut a little bevel on the end of that. Uh, I don't know if you can see that or not. It's quite small. I have a little bevel cut on there to prevent a blowout of the end grain that way. So I'm gonna slide that in there and have at it. Right up until that bevel disappears, it's not gonna blow out the back side of the cut. And you'll notice that um, I'm not hitting that line exactly. So either this has been um, plain such that this wasn't a square corner when I uh, actually drew that line, or my fence itself is out of squares. So that's how I know I need to go grab a square and double check that. So here I have my steric combo square so I can double check this. I'll put it right up against the sole of the plane and slide it into place and see if there are any gaps here and there aren't. So I know it's not this that is out of square, but if it was, I would just loosen this toggle, move it just a tiny bit with the far end and tighten it down, and it will hold its setting at any angle just by doing that. Um, it's not going to get goofed up by the fact that there is a, a nearby detent kind of pushing it one way or the other. So that's one thing that's really neat about this adjustable fence is that it will hold the setting that I set it at. Really appreciate that. Another way I can avoid blowing out the fibers at the back end of the cut without using the sacrificial fence to do so is not to put a bevel on there with a paring chisel, but to actually use a knife line. So here I'm going to use my wheel gauge, my marking gauge, to put a nice deep line on the back edge of that, but all the way around as well. Say that this is the actual length that I want this piece to be. Finish putting that line all the way around. Give it a couple passes each way because I really want this line to be nice and deep and established. Because that's how I'm going to avoid blowing that out. So I'm going to come in here and start pairing this to length. And that's the thing about a shooting board that not everybody seems to realize is that I can take down to you know the few thousandths of an inch off of here at a time. And that's something that you can't even really do very easily with a table saw. So this allows a degree of accuracy that you can't even get with, you know, you know, three or three, four or five thousand dollar table saw. So this is an important thing to have in your shop, I think, even if you are more of the uh, power tool using persuasion. But I don't know if you can see that in here. I can try to get it close, but I'm getting right down to my knife line now. I'm getting really close. And you can see that it's um, a little bit jagged around the edge here because I'm so close, but I can watch that line from the top and just take a few passes at a time until that part disappears. And now it's nice and smooth right up to that back corner with no blow out of the fibers. Now it's important that when you're trying to do this that you take a pretty light cut and that your blade is good and sharp. If you have a dull blade or you're taking off big bites, yeah, you're probably going to blow out that back corner, but if you're you know, taking her easy, you can get really nice clean results without having to resort to a sacrificial fence by doing it like that. All right, now let's do a little bit of an angle cut just so you can kind of see how the adjustable angle fence works in action here. So say I want this angle to be a little bit more obtuse that way. So I will come in here with, again, a little paring chisel. Just take a little bevel on the back side of that. And then I'm going to adjust my angle such that I'm making that angle a little more obtuse at this corner. And you'll see I just tighten that toggle right there. And now I'm actually hitting my sacrificial fence. And I don't use it as a sacrificial fence because I paired that little bevel on the back side of there. All I want it to do is to support my work for the most part. So I'll scoot it over and hit that enough times that I've got my angle established 
And then, oh, there you go. I'm right there at the edge now. So now this is more of an angle that way. Now, I can also use wedge-shaped scraps like this as a support for doing odd angles on odd-shaped pieces. So normally you wouldn't put a piece that has a shape like this on a shooting board, but say I want to use this as some kind of like applied decorative thing. So maybe I want to clip these corners at an angle like that. Well, I'll come in here like this, put that back to 90, then I'll stick my wedge in there, and that will support my workpiece as I clip those corners. So I'll come in there like that. Now I have a little clip corner on that side, and then I can do the same thing on the back. Until the two sides, whoops, bump the camera there, until the two sides match each other, and I can of course bring that in as far as I want for the sake of how it looks. So I actually use my shooting board to shape small parts all the time. As long as you support the backside of that workpiece so that doesn't, you know, get caught by the blade and, and sent flying, um, you can put all kinds of angles on all kinds of little parts like this. It's not so hard if you have a shooting board. Now while there will be occasions where you're working with a workpiece that's so small, so thin and delicate that, you know, clipping off the back corner with a paring chisel or putting a knife line in it, neither of those little tricks is going to work to prevent blow out of the back corner of that piece. It's just going to just chunk out like you wouldn't believe. And of course I don't like to use a sacrificial fence because then I have to keep replacing it. And so what I do instead to square these and to even trim them to a certain extent is to go back to my old shooting board and I'll show you what I still use that for. So here's my old shooting board back in action. And you'll see that what I have in it is not a shooting plane, but what uh, Veritas calls a shooting sander. So um, this functions in much the same way that a shooting board plane does, except it doesn't use a blade. It uses this adhesive backed sandpaper. And I believe what I have on here right now is 180 grit, which I find works really well for my purposes. And it turns out that the sole of that shooting sander is the pretty much the exact same width as the bottom sole of my Lee Nielsen number 51, which means I can plop it right into that groove on either of these shooting boards if I want. And uh, it works perfectly fine that way. And so when I drop that into the shooting board and hit the end grain of this piece, I can square up that edge. And because I'm using a pretty fine sandpaper in this case, it doesn't blow out the backside corner of that tiny little piece of veneer that I'm working on right here. That is another way that I can avoid blowing out the back end of a cut like that. And again, this is another case where I can adjust the angle and kind of freehand it. There you go, I just rounded over that corner, just like that. So you can use it to do shaping like that as well, but not only does it you know, square the end of it and prevent blowout, but it actually smooths the end of it too. So I have very little sanding to do if this is going to be exposed later uh, before um, I apply finish to it. So uh, the Veritas shooting standard is excellent for the purposes of dealing with little pieces like this. So that's the Veritas shooting sander. And this one has uh, about eight inches of length on it. It's basically like a piece of aluminum angle that has a spot for your sandpaper. This blade actually can be loosened and adjusted to a different position. And they actually do this in another length. Uh, I believe it's 16 inches and it goes for about, uh, I don't know, 59, 60 bucks, something like that. And with how often I use this to work on small pieces, I kind of wish I had more length to, uh, you know, sand on the end of a piece per stroke. So I would really like to get the 16 inch version of this sometime. Veritas shooter san shooting sander is a good thing to have around. So yeah, I hope it's a little more clear now why it is that I believe my shooting board plane is one of the most important hand planes in my shop, if not the most important. I hope you got some ideas for what kind of equipment is out there that might be able to help you out in your shop. And I also hope that you got some ideas for how to put those pieces of equipment to use to get the most out of them. So I appreciate you watching. We'll catch up to you next time. Now, if you like what you saw here, please hit like and subscribe. It helped me out a lot. Also hit the little bell icon if you want to be notified anytime I release a new video. And if you didn't like what you saw here, keep it to yourself, pal. Or watch one of my other videos. You might like one of those. Thank you for watching.